Um, so my name is Justin Fignani, and I work in Chrome on things like Web Components, Polymer, and LitHTML. And right now I'm going to talk about the virtue of laziness. Um, next slide. Advance. Today is the day. Ah, that happened? Yeah, OK. Um, so we're going to look at how to do less, uh, be lazy, and take breaks, and end up with a better web application for it. Uh, and when I say better, uh, I'm really talking about four overlapping goals here. Uh, we want to deliver great user experiences, and we want our apps to be fast and to respond quickly to input and changes. Uh, and more than just making fast apps or making it possible to build fast apps, we want to make this easy. Uh, so easy, hopefully, that it's the default. Um, because this is going to make our users happy, our developers happy, and happy developers will make better user experiences in the long run. Um, so with these four kind of general goals in mind, um, I'm going to walk through several techniques for leveraging asynchronous programming for building better UIs. Uh, so we're going to look at batching work for better performance and developer experience, uh, keeping our UIs responsive with non-blocking rendering, managing async state for a better user experience and developer experience, experience uh, and then finally coordinating async UIs once we have all this asynchronicity throughout our application. Um, and this makes for a handy little talk outline right here, so I'm going to give some background and then jump right into it. Uh, but first, a quick note. Uh, this is day two of the Dev Summit, so it's a little more future uh, forward looking, you know. And uh, the stuff I've made here, the demos and, and helper code, is a little bit uh, experimental. But it's only using current browser features. And so all of these techniques uh, still work today. Um, so now for a little background. Um, I mentioned that I work on web components and lit HTML. So we're going to use these things as the basis uh, for the demos and the talk. Um, so if you haven't used Web Components before, uh, Web Components lets you define your own HTML element tags. Um, so it really refers to two specs here, uh, custom elements and shadow DOM. Uh, and combined, they let you define your own tags with custom implementation and UI. Um, so to create a custom element, you simply extend from HTML element a built-in class. Uh, you add your implementation. And then you register your class with a specific tag name with the browser. And from there, you can use this element and that tag name anywhere you can use HTML. So in your main page document, uh, inner HTML, document create element, uh, even in other frameworks. Right? Uh, so next, lit HTML. So lit HTML is a way to write declarative HTML templates in JavaScript. Um, and we use tagged template literals to write them. This is a feature that came out in uh, ES6. Uh, and these are strings that are denoted with backticks instead of quotes, and they can have a template tag in front of them. And we're going to use the lit.html template tag here, which is just going to allow us to process this template to make it more efficient. Uh, and then inside of our template, we can have expressions, and these are just plain JavaScript expressions. Uh, once you have a template, if you want to render it to the DOM, you simply pass it to the lit.html render function and give it a node to render to, and it's going to make that DOM appear there. Um, and the nice thing is that if you call this render function multiple times with the same template but different data, lit.html is going to take care to only update the expressions that changed. It will never update the rest of the DOM uh, in the template. Uh, and then finally, if you take web components and lit.html and combine them together, you end up with lit element. So lit element is a uh, convenient way to write web components. Uh, because this is day two and a little more forward looking, I'm using some future JavaScript features here, like um, decorators and class fields. And lit element really gives you two features. Uh, one is the ability to declare observable properties. So these decorators here are going to create getters and setters instead of a field here. And the setters are going to recognize when this property changes and then tell the element that it needs to update. Uh, the other feature is that it lets you write a render method that returns a lit.html result. And so when the element knows that it needs to update, it's going to call this render method, take the result, and render it to the shadow root of this custom element. Uh, and then finally, we give you a little helper here so you can use a decorator to register the element. Uh, so once you do that and you create your element, then you can use it anywhere you would HTML, and it will render as you expect. Um, so that brings us to our first technique here, which is batching work. And if we go back to our element definition, we'll see the, in the render method here, um, you know, this is called for us automatically by the lit, H, lit element base class. Um, but the question that comes up here is when is this method called? Um, so to look at that, let's, let's take a look at a little example here. We're going to use this element imperatively, uh, but this also applies if you used it in the main HTML or if you used it with a framework. So we're going to create an element instance, and then we're going to set a property. 
So the question is, should we render now? Um, we could render now, but we don't know that we're not going to set another property right after we set this property here. Um, and if we did render after every property set, we would be rendering multiple times, potentially, for every element as we update the data. We don't want to do that, so instead we're going to enqueue a task. Um, and then in the future, that task is going to run and actually render the element. And so that we know when the element has rendered and when it's complete, uh, we add this promise uh, hanging off the element here called update complete. And this is going to resolve when the element has rendered. And if you wait for it, you know that you have a fully rendered element. Uh, and the way that this works is we have an asynchronous update pipeline uh, under the hood and lit element. So when a setter is called for a property, it's going to call this request update method. That's going to schedule an update task. Uh, but it's only going to schedule one if there isn't one existing. If there is one, we're just going to use that same task, and that's how we get the batching. When that task runs, it's going to call the update method on the element, and that's where the actual work is done to render to the DOM. Uh, so we do this for two reasons. One is performance, like I mentioned, uh, and the other is developer ergonomics. So if we go back to the template here, uh, we see that this template renders two different properties in the same template. And it's much easier to reason about these templates if we don't have to worry about the order in which these properties are set or whether or not they've both been set together or not. So we'd like to take all the changes that are incoming for an element, batch them together, and then let you write a simple declarative template to render your element. Uh, and so an interesting implication of this is that lit element render, rendering is always async. Uh, you never opt into being async, and you can't opt out to being synchronous. Um, and when we explain this to people, sometimes we get a question, won't the UI partially update? Um, and the answer is no. And I built a little animation here to try to show this. So here we have a tree of elements. Uh, let's assume these are all lit elements, and they're passing data down the tree via properties. Um, and so that's our component tree. And then right here we have the microtask queue. Um, so hopefully in other talks they've talked about this. We have a queue of microtasks that the browser runs through to completion uh, before it will paint or handle user input. Uh, the yellow box here is our current microtask. And so if we have some code that runs that's going to set a property on A, that's going to cause its microtask to be enqueued. Um, and then when A gets to run, it might set some properties on B and C, so their tasks are going to be enqueued. And B is going to set some properties on D and E. C is going to set some on F and so forth. And we get to run through this entire queue until it's empty. Once it's empty, then the browser can paint. Um, and to show this with a demo, um, I made a demo here of a tree of elements, and each one takes an artificially long time to render. And so normally, um, you, know, you, you might expect, if you don't know how the microtask queue works, that these might paint in individually. And we'll see here that if we click the render button here, that they all snap in at once. So even though each one takes 50 milliseconds and the whole thing takes 750 milliseconds, we don't see the intermediate states. Um, and this is great if your UI is painting fast, if it's not taking 750 milliseconds. Um, but if your UI, uh, if you have a very complex tree and your UI is rendering slowly, then we've just introduced jank, which we don't want. Uh, so this brings us to the next technique, which is non-blocking rendering to keep a responsive UI. Uh, so we just saw that we can have async rendering but still block paint and input. And we know we can have complex UIs that take a long time to render. And we know we need to render in less than 10 milliseconds to keep our 60 frame per second target. Um, and one way to look at this is that we have all these microtasks uh, here in the blue rectangles. And they kind of fill out a complete task. And this task blocks rendering. And as long as the complete task fits within, fits within our 10 millisecond budget, uh, we're fine, right? But as soon as the task exceeds the budget, we're going to introduce jank. So our technique here is to break this up so that instead of having a whole bunch of microtasks in one long task, we just give a task per component to render. Um, and now these will hopefully fit in under 10 milliseconds, and we will get smooth updates. Um, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to tap into this asynchronous update pipeline that lit element has. And we're going to customize the schedule update task step right here. Um, so that brings us to our first experimental helper uh, that we're calling for the moment lazy lit element. Um, and the way that this works is that under the hood in lit element, uh, there's a method called schedule update. And by default, this thing just waits for a microtask, and then it calls validate, which does the work of rendering. Um, and so what we do in lazy lit element is we override this, and instead of waiting for a microtask, we wait for a promise that's resolved on set timeout timing. It's a very simple thing to do, but it lets the browser paint and handle input before we render. 
So now if we go back to this demo here, we can turn on lazy rendering. Um, and now everything's going to render on set timeout timing. And you can see that we paint the intermediate steps here um, as we go. And so we've reduced jank um, in, by showing some intermediate state. Um, and so a lot of frameworks have been working on uh, asynchronous rendering over the years, and especially React recently. Um, and they have created a demo that I quite like, which is a Sierpinski triangle demo. And the way this works is that you have a large tree of components here. And each one of these has also been written to take an artificially long amount of time. And they all have a label. And this label represents data flowing down the tree. So to update the label on all the components is going to take a little bit of time. And while we're updating the label, we're going to animate the size of the tree. And we want this animation to be smooth. And it's driven from JavaScript. So if we take a long time to up the tr update the tree, we're going to get jank. Um, this is a nice demo because it highlights some subtleties that you need to take care of when doing asynchronous rendering. So we have an expensive subtree to render. We want this continuous script-driven animation to be smooth. And then on top of that, we have these high priority inputs that we also want to handle. Uh, so I implemented this here with regular lit element that uses the microtask queue. And you can see that as the triangle updates in size, we get some jank in the middle there. And we want to avoid that. So it's very simple to re-implement this just by changing the base class to lazy lit element. And now you can see that we get a smooth animation uh, even as we update the labels here. Uh, but next, I mentioned we want to have these high priority inputs. So this brings us to the idea of urgent updates. Um, if you defer rendering, it's possible that you have situations where you want to render sooner than you've scheduled yourself to be rendering. Um, and so with these urgent updates, what we've done is we've created, in lazy lit element, we don't just uh, override the schedule update method. We add a new method on here called request urgent update. And that's going to be called and you know, make your uh, element render sooner. Uh, and it's a very simple implementation. I wanted to show it because it's a little bit interesting. So instead of waiting for a promise that resolves with set timeout, we still do that. But we also store, um, let me go back here. Uh, maybe not. OK, well, we, store a f we restore the um, resolve function uh, on the instance of the element um, when, we request, or when we schedule an update. And then we can go back and we can um, call that resolve function, which will cause our promise to resolve earlier than it was scheduled to. So in essence, we're kind of jumping from the task queue over to the micro task queue, and we're going to render as soon as possible. Um, OK, and so this is how you would use it. So we have a partial implementation of our um, dot element here. And these are some event callbacks that might be called uh, from on mouse over and on mouse out. And they're simply going to set the state that our rendering is based on. And then they're going to call request urgent update uh, to kick us to the faster timing. Uh, and so once we do that, you can see that we have our smooth animation, our labels update, and we get a fast hover over effect here by calling request urgent update. Um, OK, and let me talk real quick about scheduling. So uh, in that demo there, I did a very simple thing. I said, instead of using a micro task, we're going to use a full task. Um, and I actually didn't expect that to work as well as it did when I made the demo, but it did work very well. The browser ends up doing a very good job of kind of executing as many tasks as it can before it has to paint a frame. Um, but it's pretty naive, and it leaves off a lot of features that we would like, like different priority queues, the ability to cancel work, the ability to coordinate long chains of tasks that are all related together. Um, so that schedule update method is exactly where we would like to plug into a native platform scheduler API, like Shuby and Jason talked about earlier. Um, so the, the important point is that with web components, we don't have a kind of overarching framework that can coordinate and schedule our components for us. And we might get components from different vendors. So being able to plug into a global platform vendored API for scheduling is going to help us tremendously here. OK, there we go. Let's move on to uh, talking about managing async state. So, so far, we've talked about being asynchronous on a per component level, so yielding to the browser and letting it paint in between components. Um, but sometimes we need to manage data that itself is asynchronous. And lit HTML rendering is synchronous by nature. When you give the render function a template, it's going to do all the work immediately to render that. Um, so what do we do if we want to render asynchronous data inside of a synchronous template? Um, so we can look at how we handle data normally here. And if we have a string and just kind of a plain reference to that string, um, it's pretty easy to use. We just use it in a template, and we get the rendering that we wanted. 
Um, and if we change this instead to uh, load off the network, it turns out the lit.html handles promises already. And so what we'll get is a blank screen here, and then when the promise resolves, we'll render hello world. Um, so this is kind of nice. We get some behavior that we might expect um, right out of the box. Um, but we might not want to render a blank screen uh, as our initial state. So this brings us to the idea of directives. Um, and these are functions that are a little bit special, and they're able to customize how templates are rendered by lit.html. And one of the more useful directives that lit.html ships with is called until. Um, and what until does is it takes a promise, and it will render the result of that promise when it resolves, but it will render a placeholder until that promise does resolve. Um, so we can use that here. And you see that in the template, um, we call the until directive with our promise uh, in the loading placeholder, and that's going to show first. And then when it resolves, we're going to render our, our content there. Um, so this example is a little bit too simple because it assumes that we have this promise available already that we want to use. And a lot of times, uh, instead, we want to run some task uh, when we need to render. And we might have some operation that's dependent on some instance state. Um, so in this version of the example here, we have a file name property, and we want to fetch some data based on that file name. Now, we might be tempted to call fetch inline with the template um, so that we'll fetch the correct file and then render it. Um, and this does work, but it has a problem where every time we render this template, we're going to call fetch. And we might be rendering the template because some other properties change. Um, and in this case, we're going to flood the network with lots of fetch requests. Um, and we also might show an alternating kind of loading and uh, resolve state in our UI. Um, but it's almost the mental model that we want, right? So what we really want to do is we want to be able to run a task that's dependent on some data only when that data changes. And so that brings us to the next uh, experimental helper here that we call run async. Um, and what run async does is it performs an async operation, but only when the data it depends on changes. Um, and it's actually a kind of directive factory. So the way it works is that you give it an async function uh, that takes some data and produces a result, and it returns to you a directive that you can use inside your lit.html template. Um, so if we want to reproduce uh, the previous example here using uh, this fetch, we can just create a fetch content directive um, by passing run async a function that takes a file name and calls fetch for us. And when we go to use it, we can just use it inside of our template, and we pass it um, the file name here, and then we pass it a, a another template that's going to render when we have um, successfully resolved that promise. Um, so this lets us get um, part of the way to our goal here. Um, we, can, we can render some asynchronous data, but it turns out that asynchronous data can be in a number of different states. Um, for any as async operation, you can be an initial state, which means you haven't started it. You can be pending. Uh, it can have successfully completed or ended in failure. And so it really helps us if we model and think about all of these states uh, explicitly so that we make sure we handle them. We can see that our directive actually takes templates for um, uh, all of the different states that our UI can be in. So we have a success template, a pending template, an uh, initial state template, and the error template. Um, and to make this a little bit more realistic, I made a demo that searches the NPM package repository. Um, and this is a basic kind of search as you type live uh, search result demo, and it has a simple UI. We just have a search box uh, and a results panel down here. OK, so we're going to build this demo in two parts, hopefully. Um, so first, we're going to define a search packages directive using run async. Um, and so here's our initial starting point for this directive. We're, our async task function here is going to um, generate a URL for the NPM uh, search service here uh, and then get the results by fetching it. Um, and then here, we're going to handle the response and just do a little bit of due dil diligence and make sure that we have a, a 200 response and return that. Otherwise, we uh, throw the message we got back. And I wanted to make this um, task able to kind of trigger that initial state template. Uh, and the way we do that in async is that we throw, um, in run async, we throw an initial state error. So here, I'm just going to check to make sure we have a query we can execute. And if not, I'm going to throw this error, and run async is going to render um, the initial state template. Uh, and then it turns out that the NPM registry is a little difficult to get it to trigger an error. Usually, it just returns empty results. So to be able to show uh, the error state template, I just do some pre-validation here of the query and make sure we don't start with a dot or underscore. And then finally, to make this uh, even more realistic, if you're doing a search-as-you-type UI, uh, you're going to have a lot of requests that you initiate 
where you don't care about the results because you've typed in you know, a different query by the time the result gets back. Um, and so the Fetch API is able to take something called an abort signal so that we can cancel the requests. And so Run Async will generate an abort signal for you, and then you get it in this options argument here, and you can forward this on to the Fetch API. Um, and so this is our uh, entire search packages directive here uh, built with Run Async. And so next, we just need to use it. Um, here's a little snippet of the demo UI. We have an input um, element here, which just simply displays the query and updates the query on input. And then down here, we use the search packages uh, directive. Um, and so we use it by passing it the query, and then we give it a success template. Here, we just iterate over the results and display little cards. Uh, and then we give it the pending uh, initial and error state uh, templates here. Uh, and so when we go to use this demo, we, we see that we have the initial state template rendering. Sorry, that's small. It says enter a search term. When we type, it turns into loading, and then we get our results back. Um, and if we were to go back and enter a query that starts with an invalid character, you're going to see the error template there, and that even updates as you type. Uh, and if you realize your mistake and go in and type in a new term, you're going to get all the uh, uh, intermediate um, uh, async state templates as you type. So that's the demo, and that, you really did see most of the implementation there, so it was uh, quite easy to do with that directive. Um, and the key takeaway here is that we want to explicitly model our asynchronous operation state. Um, if we do that, we're more sure to take care of all the states uh, that we can be in. And if we build a UI for each state, then we're going to uh, accurately let our users know what is going on with the application, and they're going to have a better user experience. Uh, OK, so finally, once we have an application and a UI built up of all these uh, asynchronous components, we might need to coordinate them. Right? So if you have a lot of async children um, in your page, um, how do we ensure a consistent UI if you want to? Um, or how do we avoid a sea of spinners? Uh, and so uh, I added to the, to, to demonstrate the sea of spinners problem, I added to the demo a little feature here where when you search, the cards are going to do their own query to bring up the disk tag of your NPM packages. Um, and you can see there that we saw a lot of spinners on the page. And this can be kind of a distracting UI. Uh, so we want to give developers an option to not have to uh, deal with a sea of spinners. And the way we're going to handle this is that we're going to coordinate the components here with events. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to fire a promise carrying event. Um, and that promise is going to resolve when some work is done. So an async child component uh, creates a promise, fires this event, and then resolves the promise. Um, and so that's going to look like this. A is going to be our container up there, um, and E and F are our async children. And they're going to fire this pending state event that holds a promise. The, con the container is going to handle the event and wait for that promise. And then the children, when their work is done, they're going to resolve the promise. And finally, uh, when all the promises have settled, uh, we're going to update the UI. So that brings us to our last uh, experimental uh, prototype here called pending container. And pending container kind of takes care of all this uh, plumbing for you. Um, and it's a class mix-in, so you can apply this to a super class like lit element. And this has two features, too. Um, we have a has pending children property. Um, so this indicates whether or not there's async work happening below you. Um, and when this property changes, it's going to cause a re-render of the element. Um, and then we have an event listener that listens, listens for the pending state event and then triggers the bookkeeping so that we know if we have any extra work uh, pending below us. Uh, and to use it, you can just apply this mix-in um, to the superclass here, to lit element. And once you do that, you get available the has pending children property that you can use in your template. Um, and so now we're going to add a spinner, and this is a top-level spinner, um, to the UI that's triggered um, based on whether or not there's any pending children. And so the run async helper is going to fire these events for us, and this container mix-in is going to capture them. And so what we're going for here is a UI where we have a spinner, and it happened again. There we go. OK. Might just be a faulty button here. Um, so what we want to add here is a spinner at the top of the UI that's going to be going whenever there are uh, pending search results coming back from the server, or we have children that need to update. So now you see we get the spinner as we type. Um, we don't get the spinner on the children, but we can see the top level spinner is still going, uh, and then the results come in and the spinner stops. Um, and so that's the UI we were going for, and it was uh, pretty straightforward to build with these directives. Um, so when you have an asynchronous UI, there's a lot of different options that you have for how to handle this. Um, you could try to block the UI 
uh, while you have pending work. You could show the raw incremental updates. Uh, you could have individual spinners on your page, or you could try to replace that all with top-level placeholders and spinners. Um, so the, what you want to do kind of depends on the UX and the UI that you're trying to build. But the key here is to provide the plumbing and the framework and the nice API so that you can uh, build whatever you choose to build. And that went two slides forward. All right, well, this is my wrap up. Um, so we're very excited about some additional work that's going to be done in this area. So Jason and Shuby talked about the native scheduler API, which we're ex extremely excited about. Um, display locking is a new proposal where you're going to be able to lock an entire portion of your screen so that you can update it incrementally and then flip it to the new version. And Gray talked about virtual scroller, which is going to let us handle large amounts of data um, as well. And then on our end, we're going to be working on more libraries and examples of how to do things like lazy load components, uh, background rendering, and uh, viewport-based visibility rendering so that things only render when they uh, show up on the screen. Um, I have a few links here. These will probably be easier to get to from the video. Um, and then I'm going to be over in the Ask Chrome area doing Q&A after this if you'd like to ask any questions. OK, thank you. Thank you.